Beer is so old that we don't know how old it is. Most of the earliest known cultures brewed it, and some scholars believe that it was the quest for beer, not bread, that motivated our hunter-gatherer ancestors to settle down and cultivate grain. But ancient cave dwellers weren't sitting around the fire quaffing crisp loggers and hazy IPAs. Archaeological evidence shows that beer took thousands of years to evolve into what we drink today. The first beer probably came from Africa, because that's where the first people were. Beer is basically fermented grain. First, moisture makes the grain sprout, priming its enzymes to transform starch into sugar. Yeast then converts the sugar into alcohol. Humans would have discovered this process by happy accident, probably in many places around the world at different times. A pile of grain sat out in the rain and sun. Some wild yeast latched onto its sugar. And a few days later, you got some beer. They learned to replicate the process, creating beer traditions nearly everywhere, although no evidence has been found of a Paleolithic African brew. It is suspected it would have been made from wild millet or sorghum. Grains long cultivated and used for beer in Africa and flavored with whatever grew nearby. A waypoint between bread and beer is a kind of spiked porridge that would stretch any modern beer connoisseur's definition of chewy. A team of Stanford researchers found something like that in Israel in 2015 when they came across what may have been a 13,000-year-old beer-making operation in a burial cave near Haifa. It was used by the Natchifian people, who were known to harvest and process wild grain. In stone mortar carved into the cave's bedrock floor, the team found traces of starch consistent with a very thick wheat and barley-based alcohol. Some scholars would like more evidence that beer and not bread was being made in that specific cave, because the tools and processes are similar. Kirk French, a teacher of anthropology of alcohol, Pennsylvania State University, who was not involved in the Stanford study, said that it makes sense that the Natufians would have been brewers since they had grain for a long time. He added, if they weren't making beer, it would be different than every other place in the world that are staple crops. If they had grain, they had alcohol. The first chemically confirmed evidence of a fermented beverage came from pottery found at the Neolithic settlement of Jahu, and it must have been quite a taste sensation, rice beer, wine and honey mixed together. The concoction was solid evidence that brewing dates at least to about the time nomadic people started to put down roots and develop agriculture. Since then, evidence of brewing has been found at several Chinese sites from a similar era. A Dartmouth team found traces of a more beer-forward brew, 9,000-year-old beer cups in Kiautu, that contained rice, a grain called Job's tares, and some kind of tuba. We know beer was a key part of daily life for ancient Sumerians, Babylonians and Egyptians because they wrote about it, and their brews were a little closer to the stuff we drink today in some innovative ways. They roasted the grain to make dark beers, produced it in large breweries, and used barley, the most common ingredient in modern beers. Among the world's first known writing samples, clay tablets that contain Sumerian cuneiform, are beer sales receipts and brewing instructions, the latter in a poem that celebrates Ninkasi, the Sumerian goddess of, you guessed it, beer. Chemist Rudolf H. Michel confirmed the earliest chemical proof of barley beer, dating to 3500 to 3100 BC, in jars found in the Sumerian outpost of Godin Tepe, in what is now Iran. Fermenting grain was simply a practical way to preserve grain between growing seasons for many ancient civilizations, and the beer that resulted was nutrient-dense. Brewers made low-alcohol versions for children and for everyday hydration and some workers were paid partially in beer. Laborers who built the pyramids of Giza, for instance, received more than 10 pints per day. But brewers also knew how to bump up the alcohol content for special occasions and medicinal purposes. Beer was even a part of the afterlife, or at least Egyptians hoped so. In the Penn Museum's collection, 
is a part of a priest's burial chamber covered in hieroglyphic instructions for living visitors. Mesopotamian and Egyptian brews were still a long way from modern beers in flavor and appearance. Depictions of Sumerian beer drinkers show people with reed straws sipping from communal knee-high pots. Experts say the beer that was made in those pots probably would have been chunky, with grain and soaked bread called papir floating in it. The straws were probably for poking through or around a layer of yeast, spent grain, and other stuff that floated on the top to get to the good stuff underneath. Chicha de Hora, a fermented corn drink dear to many Latin American cultures, was the first known beer in the Americas. We're slotting this beer into our story at 550 AD, the time period of the Chicha-loving people of Tiwanaku in modern Bolivia in South America. But it could go just about anywhere in the timeline. There is evidence that Chicha was made 7,000 years ago. It was a diet staple in the Andean region four thousands of years, and it is still common today. Like most ancient beers, chicha was traditionally made by women, but the process was a little unusual. It was, and sometimes still is, made by chewing corn, so that saliva releases the sugars and kickstarts fermentation. The original stuff was cloudy, yellow-orange and mealy, or gritty with a little foam. But now, just about anything goes, including leaving out the corn. Many regions make signature variations of chicha using different fruits, spices, flavors, and even other grains, such as rice or quinoa. Some, such as Peruvian chicha morada, are non-alcoholic. We know that the ancestors of modern Bavarians were brewing by the Bronze Age because traces of beer bread flavored with oak leaves, an ancient preservative, were found in a crop near Kassendorf that dates to 700 BC. Their descendants would transform the flavor and aroma of beer forever with a different preservative, hops, a relative of the cannabis plant. European hops originated in the Georgian region of Eastern Europe and Western Asia. Experts believe it was the Vikings who were the first to add hops to beer. Evidence from relics found at a Viking settlement in northern Germany shows that they used hops for something so it would make sense they used them to preserve the beer that they exported by sea. For sure, Benedictine monks in Germany, Belgium, and northeastern France were brewing with hops by the 9th century. The first written record of hops being used in beer is from a monastery in 822. Monasteries were great centers of brewing, in part because monks and nuns were among the few in the Dark Ages who could read and write, so they could document their recipes and techniques. By the 14th century, beer made with hop flowers was common in much of Europe. For most of history, all beer was technically ale because it was fermented at room temperature primarily by a yeast that rose to the top, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. No yeasts were completely pure until 1883. By the end of the Middle Ages, a mysterious hybrid type of yeast in Bavaria was doing something different. It sank to the bottom and fermented in cool temperatures. It took weeks or months instead of days, and it produced a lighter, milder tasting beer that was easy to drink and didn't spoil nearly as quickly as ale. Brewers called the Stahlager, from the German word meaning to store, and they created what is now the world's most popular style of beer. Like ales, lager can be light or dark depending on how the grain malt is roasted. The early ones had a smoky, spicy flavor, but not a lot of carbonation. The yeast that makes lager was later dubbed S. Pastorianus for Louis Pasteur, who in 1857 figured out how fermentation works. British brewing goes back at least to the first century and probably earlier. Shortly after English colonists settled in Jamestown in 1607, they started importing English ale. Within a few years, Dutch immigrants began the first US commercial brewery in what is now New York. Beer was liquid bread to the early American colonists. Everyone drank beer as a cornerstone of their diet. First, it was English ale. Then thick porters, 
which originated in London in the 1700s, became popular with the working class on both sides of the pond. English ales were and are less bitter and skunky than modern American porters and ales thanks to different hops. The porter back then, aged in oak barrels, also was more sour than current ones, in part because of bacteria that infiltrated the yeast they used. Many experts nowadays are amused by the recent infatuation with sour beers, because 18th century brewers did everything they could, which wasn't a lot, to keep bacteria from spoiling or souring their beer. The first predominantly US beer was a molasses small beer, which exploded in popularity in the mid-18th century. The trade relations with Caribbean countries made the sticky refined sugar cheap and easy to import. Another type of small beer, so named because of its low alcohol content, typically 2-4%, was made by reusing grain from a previous brew. People of all social classes drank some version of molasses beer, even George Washington. It was sometimes flavored with creative ingredients, such as sassafras, ginger, coriander, or cayenne. A recipe for it appears in the 1824 compilation, The Virginia Housewife by Mary Randolph, which is considered to be the first Southern cookbook. In the mid-1800s, German, Austrian, and Czech immigrants built an enormous logger industry in northern and midwestern U.S. cities, such as Milwaukee, Pittsburgh, and St. Louis. Tech innovations, such as mechanical refrigeration, the mercury thermometer, and the hydrometer, which measured alcohol content, helped them standardize their products. New railroads let them transport around the country. In the mid-1900s, metal cans became a de facto symbol of big beer. Then came a microbrew rebellion that was started by a Maytag and propelled by Jimmy Carter. Fritz Maytag, from the washing machine family, bought and rejuvenated a struggling historic San Francisco brewery in 1965 and profitably produced Anchor Steam, a crossover between lager and ale, and other old-style beers. In 1978, the United States had 89 breweries, a post-prohibition low, according to Brewers Association data. But that year, Carter signed a bill that made homebrewing legal in the United States. Soon, hobbyists turned entrepreneurs opened startup microbreweries, including two on the coast that would grow into early craft powerhouses, Sierra Nevada in the west and Sam Adams in the east. Once those two blew up, everybody east and west coast just started jumping in line, and everybody wanted to do it. As of 2022, there were 9,709 US breweries in July, Anchor Brewing closed, but Maytag's spirit and tradition lives on with every oddly flavored, bizarrely named quaff in neighborhood brewpubs across the country. Well, thank you for joining us on this exploration of beer's evolution. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share, and comment below if you have a specific beer you love. Cheers to the past, present, and future of beer. Until next time.